Hello, everybody. Um, I'm not used to having myself on the screen. It's usually just the slides. Um, right, I'm here to talk to you today about crypto for everyone. Um, uh, this is all about Libsodium in PHP 7.2. Uh, my name is Marcus Boynton, as you saw. Um, I work for a little two-man company in the UK. We have an email marketing company called smartmessages.net. And as part of that, I'm also the maintainer of PHP Mailer, which probably means at some point, more or less everybody has used my code um, for my sins. Uh, <laughs> I also um, do occasional pen testing and technical reporting for Radically Open Security, which is a pen testing company based here in Amsterdam. Though I'm British, I live in France, um, in the mountains, because uh, mountains are good. You don't have them here, but uh, I like them. Anyway, so to kick off, what is crypto? Well, let me tell you all about Bitcoin. As you know, that's rubbish. Uh, crypto has nothing to do with Bitcoin. Uh, crypto is short for cryptography which comes from Latin, crypto meaning secret, graphy meaning writing. And it has three main functions in, um, in the kind of the stuff that we interact with on a, on a frequent basis. First of all, we want to be able to write messages that can be read only by the intended recipient. And we call that confidentiality. The next thing that uh, we want to be able to uh, maintain is proving that it was you that wrote a message. And we call that authenticity. Uh, there's a flip side towards authenticity, which is that if you can guarantee that you were the person that wrote it, the flip side is what's called non-repudiation, which is that you can't deny that you did write something if it's signed uh, and authenticated by you. So there are two aspects to that one. Um, the other thing we want to be able to do is prove that a message has not been altered in transit, and we call that integrity. Now, curiously, all of these things are actually pretty orthogonal. You can have more or less each of them independently in more or less any combination. Um, so we want to try and implement all of those things in stuff that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. So what are cryptographic functions and what can we use them for? Well, we can divide them up into some rough groups according to the number of keys that are involved um, with anything. And because we're programmers, we start off with zero. And there are, these are things, the functions that depend typically either on nothing at all, which it would be, say, a, a random number generators, or on purely data with no, no passwords or anything. And so that falls in categories of things such as hashes and key derivation. Um, and there's a whole bunch of algorithms and acronyms that you'll get to go with this. So you get things like MD5, SHA1, SHA2, um, Bcrypt, Argon2, and so on. And as you can see, there are lots of these things. Next thing we have is things involving one key, and that's typically <coughs> message authentication codes, known as MACs, and secret key encryption. And again, there's a whole bunch of algorithms and acronyms uh, that you're likely to encounter, such as the HMAC family, uh, AES, and CharCha20. We'll, we'll reach some of those later. Then we involve things that have two keys, and this really is public key encryption and that tends to be used for key exchange and also digital signatures. And yet again, we've got a whole bunch of uh, weirdly named um, uh, algorithms and acronyms. Um, some of these names, you notice, uh, have some odd numbers in, like we mentioned Poly1305 and the X25519. This is, uh, these are often references to the prime numbers that are used in the underlying cryptography. In the case of Poly1305, the prime number that it refers to is two to the power of 130 minus five. And in 25519, it's 2 to the power of 255, which is a really big number, uh, minus 19. Um, so they, they're essentially a short way of referring to extremely large prime numbers. But for the most part, we don't need to know about those, but that's just where their names come from. Then we also have non-cryptographic functions uh, that are related to, to cryptographic functions. So that includes things like encoding, compression, and mathematical opera operations, particularly comparisons. So we're looking at things like base64 encoding, gzip, and in particular, hash equals is a, is a significant thing in there. So all of these kind of functions are all there. 
and some of them sound really complicated, and they're complicated for a reason. The mathematics underneath them is really quite difficult and complicated, and that's actually a problem in its own right. And this often leads people to try and write their own cryptography, and that's generally a really, really bad idea. You should avoid that at all costs. Cryptographers know what they're doing with this stuff, and you really want stuff that's been battle-tested, not things that you just made up. Um, now, much of the time, you never need to use these functions directly. Most people's interaction with cryptographic stuff, unless they're actually setting out to do something like a secure messaging application or something, are not really things that you have to deal with within PHP. Um, because, for example, most of the interactions with your website will be through a web server, and that takes care of all the encryption at the transport level using TLS. And so that's not something that ever really occurs within your own code. And you're fairly unlikely to be writing your own um, uh, HTTP server or client in raw PHP. Uh, because there are things that, that exist that will do that for you without you having to worry about the detail. However, if you do need to use these things, the most likely thing you're going to encounter is hash functions. Um, and we'll cover those in a minute. So there's a long history of having uh, cryptographic functions within PHP, either in the core uh, installation or via extensions. And there's a whole long list of them. Now, um, these have changed over time. Uh, Encrypt has been around for ages. OpenSSL got some big boosts in PHP 5.3 and 5.4. The introduction of the password hash uh, and related functions in PHP 5.5 was a, a really important thing because it finally brought simple, secure by default password hashing uh, into PHP where they'd really been missing before. And that had led to a whole bunch of use of inappropriate weak hash functions like MD5. Um, and you know, WordPress used MD5 for uh, hashing passwords for many years, and that's led to many appearances of things in Have I Been Pwned that wouldn't otherwise have been there. Um, PHP 7 introduced a cryptographically secure pseudo-random number generator, catchy name, and um, that was previously not available, uh, and the hash equals function in PHP 5.6 prevented timing side channel attacks on hash comparisons. Now, Libsodium itself has been available in quite a few languages prior to PHP, uh, but it was in PHP from 5.6 via Peckle, but it was finally rolled into the PHP core distribution in 7.2 under the Sodium name. So there are actually effectively two versions. There's Peckle Sodium and Sodium. They're effectively the same, though. Uh, it's just a matter of where they actually came from, whether Peckle or the core. So which of these extensions should you use? Well. Mcrypt you will find quite frequently, but unfortunately, Mcrypt has been abandoned, abandoned where for nearly 10 years. It hasn't really been updated for a very long time. It doesn't really have any active maintainers at all. Um, essentially, if you're typing memcrypt into uh, Mcrypt into any current coding thing you're doing, you're probably doing something wrong, and you should stop and look at a different way of doing it. Um, OpenSSL. Well, OpenSSL has a very long history as well. Uh, it doesn't have quite the uh, it doesn't have the abandonware situation of mcrypt, um, but it does suffer from a lot of kind of legacy bloat. There there have been lots of really quite serious vulnerabilities in OpenSSL, particularly things like Heartbleed, and they really stem from OpenSSL just trying to do everything. Um, and it includes lots of cryptography functions which are old and weak and insecure and broken, but people can still use them. There's nothing stopping you from doing it. And unfortunately, if it's there, people will use it, and then their stuff will get broken. So unless, unless you actually need to talk to something that's using OpenSSL on the other end, uh, for which OpenSSL is perfect, um, uh, it's worth avoiding. And then finally, if you're in control of both ends of a conversation in particular, Libsodium is really the place to be because it makes a point of only including um, the good stuff and just doesn't have any bad stuff. Now, beyond the actual core and extension-based bits of PHP, there are libraries as well which sit on top of those and implement uh, various other things in different ways. So uh, Pair has some crypt packages. Uh, PHP seclib implements a whole bunch of encryption and high-level protocols like SSH. Um, that you can then use directly from PHP. But unfortunately, PHP seclib is based on mcrypt. So again, that's worth avoiding, because mcrypt uh, is really defunct. Uh, PHP encryption provides pure PHP encryption decryption. Halight is a high-level wrapper for, for libsodium functions that builds some high-level protocol implementations on top of the sodium base. So that's a, a nice set of packages. 
Uh, sodium compact is a really cool thing. That's actually libsodium implemented entirely in PHP. So even if you don't have the extension, you can run that instead. Um, although Zend is a framework as such, it's really also a component library, and you can use the Zend crypt components entirely uh, outside the framework. But generally, you should try and prefer extensions or core features over libraries because performance is important and, um, and the core features will be faster for that. But libraries provide a whole bunch of useful high-level additions on top of those things. So what is Libsodium and where does it come from? Well, it's all based on this thing called SALT, N-A-C-L, which is the Networking and Cryptography Library, which actually dates from 10 years ago, 2008, but it's still considered pretty much state-of-the-art. It's got a very nice host name, and it focuses on being a high-performance, legacy-free, heavily scrutinized open-source C library. Um, and it's resistant to many forms of attack. Uh, in particular, um, it's very careful to avoid uh, timing side channels. Um, one of the focuses of, of SALT is that it uh, tries to avoid a lot of the mistakes that previous cryptography libraries have done. And in particular, uh, it doesn't abstract things that much, and it really limits the flexibility. It's actually quite a small library. It doesn't offer that many features. Um, but this is actually a good thing for a cryptography library, because when you give people choices and they don't know what those choices mean, people will make bad decisions. So if you take those decisions away from them and only implement the good stuff, it means that people aren't going to make the same kind of silly mistakes that we've seen in the past. Now, um, Libsodium is actually a fork of salt. Um, so it just takes the, the salt base code and, and uh, builds on it. Um, it's also open source, available at libsodium.org. It supports more platforms than the original Salt library does, um, so it's also available for Python and other languages. Um, and it's been available for PHP via Peckle since 2014, but as I said before, it's been standard in PHP since 7.2. So, oh, uh, the other thing about um, Sodium is that it's uh, also available in JavaScript and WebAssembly. So you can do all the stuff that Libsodium can do on, in PHP. You can also do that on the client side in JavaScript if you really want to. The people behind it, um, well, Salt itself is the work really of uh, Daniel Bernstein, known as DJB, and uh, Tanya Lang and Peter Schwaber. Um, DJB is a professor of mathematics from Chicago and also based in Eindhoven here in the Netherlands. And he's really pretty famous in cryptography circles. He also wrote the QMail web server and the DJB DNS, uh, DNS server, and many of the reference implementations for various hashes and ciphers. Um, uh, Libsodium was written by Frank Dennis, who's a longtime PHP core contributor. Um, he's a developer and photographer based in Paris. And he also wrote the pure FTPD FTP server. And the other person that's significant in Libsodium is Scott Arkazewski. I think that's how you pronounce his name. Um, he runs a company called Paragon, and uh, he's particularly has written loads and loads of really good example code of how to write secure apps in PHP. Um, there's some really good resources on the website, and in fact, I've actually unashamedly pinched some of his examples off his site to, to use in this. So I mentioned side channels just earlier. Um, lots of people don't know what these are. Uh, a side channel, according to Wikipedia, is any attack based on information gained from the physical implementation of a system rather than weaknesses in the implant implemented algorithm itself. So that's why I chose this picture here. This gate is perfectly good. It's a really good gate. You can open it, you can walk through it, you can close it behind you. That's brilliant. It does exactly everything it's intended to do. However, the way that it's been implemented means you can just walk around it. So this is an example of a side channel attack in a physical situation. <laughs> Now, in terms of software and actual real implementations in uh, running on computers, we're talking about other things. Um, typically, timing, thermal and RF, and light, sound, and power emissions. These are all ways that uh, data can leak out of systems. Um, you can do all kinds of weird tricks in order to get data out of systems um, in ways that you might not have expected. Uh, and also to have it reveal information about the internal workings of algorithms that you really might not want to be um, available to those who shouldn't see them, like private keys, for example. Um, there have been some really good examples of these kind of attacks. The recent spectre and meltdown um, flaws found in Intel processors uh, were down to effectively a timing side channel attack on the branch prediction um, firmware inside the, the CPUs. Uh, and that kind of thing is really hard to fix. Um, and it's also very subtle, um, as a lot of these things are. Um, 
password hash timing. I'll give you an example of that in a minute. One of my favorite ones, though, is Ethernet switch lights. You know when you plug Ethernet cables into a switch and the little lights blink on and off when data goes through them? Some cheap switches power those lights or drive those lights simply by connecting the data lines directly to the lights without any kind of filtering. And LEDs have very fast switching rates and can quite happily keep up with the data rates of what's actually happening on the wire on uh, Ethernet. So it's actually possible to read the data going through the network just by looking at the lights. Um, that's a, that's a scary thing, but most, uh, most decent switches these days will actually include some kind of filtering because um, uh, these, you, know, you can't see a light that flashes on for a 10 millionth of a second, um, so they tend to filter it and smooth it out uh, to make it a little more view readable. So, how does it actually manifest in code? Well, here we have an example of a simple side channel vulnerability. Um, first of all, there's one mistake. We're using MD5 for a hash, but this is old school, so that's fine. Um, now, the key thing that happens here that, that makes the difference is that when we compare the generated hash that we've calculated from the a password that's been, that's been submitted via a post request, um, the comparison is actually happening inside the database. Now, databases, that their primary focus is really on performance. They want to return the results of this query as quickly as they possibly can. And so they're going to do this comparison accurately. There's no problem there. It's going to produce the right, right result. If you have the wrong password, you won't get the right response. So that's fine. But the problem is that because it's tuned for performance, when it compares the two strings byte for byte, it'll compare them byte for byte until it finds one that's different, at which point it will return. Now, that means that it will return very slightly quicker if you have a character that mismatches at the beginning rather than one at the end of a password hash. Now, that tiny little difference in time, it might seem infinitesimal to you. However, if you submit millions of requests to this and monitor the timings very carefully, it's possible to incrementally work out the matching password hash, um, and from that, possibly reverse the, the password. Um, so that's, that's a, a side channel attack in a real uh, sort of simple context. So the safe way of doing this is this way. We do the same kind of select on the database, except you'll notice that there isn't any comparison with the password field within that query. Um, the only thing we're comparing on is the actual email address, which in itself actually could potentially be a, um, a user enumeration uh, vulnerability where we could figure out the usernames of people, but that's somewhat less sensitive than their passwords. Um, so we, then, we fetch the whole record, regardless of whether the password's correct or not, and then we use this password verify function, which is a, a standard thing in PHP since 5.5, and to compare the submitted password with the stored hash that we have. Um, and if it doesn't match, then that's fine. Now, the thing that's different about this is that the password verify function is very carefully written so as to be what's called a constant time function. So it will take the same amount of time regardless of where the mismatch is within the strings. Now, this means that it's deliberately inefficient, but it's much more secure as a result, and it means that it's not vulnerable to a timing side channel attack. Um, Within Libsodium, the equivalent function to password verify is PW hash string verify. All the Sodium functions have this Sodium crypto prefix on them, which means they tend to sometimes get quite long in the function names. So going on to the, the fundamentals of what's going to be in our cryptography function library. Uh, first up is hashing. Um, hash algorithms are designed for various different purposes. Uh, typically, we have um, small ones, which are very often used in, certainly my first experience of hashing, is, is dividing things into bins or distributing uh, items across a range of, of possible outcomes, uh, which is why I chose these little colored boxes here. The, these are the bins that we're going to separate our things into. And the kind of things you'd use that for is things like distributing queries across uh, a cluster of memcache servers, say. That's the kind of hash function that you want there. You want to have the, a nice Nice even distribution across them, uh, but perhaps some particular features of ha what happens when things um, disappear. Like if, if memcache servers go down, what happens to the uh, to the requests? And a function like FNV uh, can help with that. Um, then we have fast ones, and these are typically used for checksums and verification, making sure that data has actually reach the other end in one piece. If you want to compare 200 gigabyte files, you could calculate a hash on one end, calculate it somewhere else, and then compare the hashes and see if they're the same. And you want those things to be as fast as possible. Um, and uh, they don't need to have any particular security associated with them. Um, 
And that covers algorithms like the MD family, it's message digest, the secure hash algorithm family, SHA1, 2, and 3, and more recently, Blake2, uh, in particular, Blake2b. Um, then we have slow ones, and these are typically for password hashing, uh, because we don't want people to be able to test these to try out different um, uh, values to see if they can figure out, the, uh, to, to be able to reverse the hash to figure out the original password. And so we want these to go slowly. Um, and this is why the use of fast ones, like MD5 and even SHA2, for example, is a poor choice for, for hashing passwords. But Oddly enough, the, the slow password hash algorithms are usually actually built out of fast ones. They just make them run many thousands or even millions of times. Um, and also by adding salts, which makes it um, uh, stops you being able to do dictionary attacks uh, or rainbow table um, reversing of the, of the hash functions. Um, and in here, we've got uh, hash functions like bcrypt, scrypt, and argon2. Now, for the most part, these slow ones are built out of the fast ones, as I mentioned before. Like PBKDF2 is actually built out of SHA2, and Argon2 is built on top of Blake2b. Within these things here, I mentioned that DJB is responsible for a lot of these reference implementations. Um, and people tend to, be, tend to stick to these reference implementations because they're usually written by the cryptographers and heavily scrutinized by other cryptographers. Um, and they, are also, they also get paranoid about performance as well. So you'll find that there are, there's lots of people comparing very tiny variations in algorithms to, to shave the odd clock cycle off the comparisons just in order to keep performance high. Now, in the case of SHA256, the reference implementation for that is only for 32-bit CPUs. And most modern CPUs are 64-bit. Um, however, the SHA512 um, hash is optimized for 64-bit for CPUs. So it's actually faster and more efficient and actually very slightly more secure to calculate an SHA-512 hash and then truncate it to 256 bits. And that's actually surprisingly common, that approach um, of using SHA-512 slash 256. Um, and Libsodium does actually use that uh, in some circumstances. Now this Argon2 thing, uh, this is uh, something that's actually um, appeared in PHP already. Uh, the argon2i algorithm is in PHP 7.2, and argon2id will be in PHP 7.3. The difference between them, argon2i has, particularly, uh, has particular resistance to side channel attacks, particularly timing. The argon2d algorithm uh, lacks that, but uh, resists attack by massively parallel things, and that's typically getting um, GPUs to try and um, try and uh, to, to do massively parallel uh, trying out combinations of hashes to, to attempt to find the reverse of them. It has things that make it inefficient on multiple GPUs, deliberately so. Um, but Argon2ID actually combines the two and gives you side channel resistance and GPU resistance. So that's really the, the current state of the art as far as password hashing goes. Now, when you're writing new apps, you would just want to use the strongest hash function available. And if you want to upgrade it from an, from an older hash that you used before, the typical action there is to rehash on login. So someone submits a plain text password, you compare it with your hash from the database. Um, when they match, you can then just rehash it using the new algorithm and then store the new hash back into the database. And telling whether you need to rehash a password is actually also a function that's available, uh, actually both in PHP and in Libsodium. So the hash functions in Libsodium split into those three categories as I said before. We've got short hash, which is a crypt we'd use for, uh, in, in place of things like CRC32 or some of the smaller, simpler, less secure hash, fun hash uh, options in the hash function. Um, then instead of using MD5, SHA1, or again, the sort of more flexible hash function in PHP, there's the generic hash, which only provides one option. It just uses Blake2b. One of the re you can see here, this is the manifestation of trying to remove options from, from, your, uh, from you as a programmer because it prevents you making mistakes. The hash function in PHP implements all kinds of hash functions, loads of them, and some of them are utterly trivial and really weak, but you won't necessarily know that as a programmer. You're, if you're a programmer, not a cryptographer, you might not know the difference between them, and you might pick, uh, you might pick something because you like the sound of its name. You know, there are things called tiger in there. That sounds cool but uh, that's probably not necessarily a, a thing to use. Um, 
Uh, so the idea with sodium is it removes you, that possibility from you, and it means that you, you can't make that mistake. It uses a really good, strong, fast hash algorithm, and you don't really have to worry about it. Um, when it comes to passwords, we've got this uh, PW hash string function, which is more or less the same as PHP's password hash function, but again, it doesn't give you a choice about what hash algorithm it's going to use, um, whereas the, the PHP version does with some problems, as we'll see later. Um, but this function uses argon2 ID, so there's only one choice there, and that function is available everywhere that PHP 7.2 and upwards will run. Next up, message authentication code. So now we start introducing a key. Now, I quite like this image for, um, for describing message authentication codes because if we were just calculating a hash, that would be the equivalent of just having a blob of wax sealing this document. And if somebody had broken it and resealed it, we'd be none the wiser. We wouldn't be able to tell that someone had done that. Whereas if it's had this stamp on it, it proves that it can only have been done by somebody that owned the stamp. And that's effectively the key that we're um, adding to this mix. And it's pretty much like a hash, but instead of just putting data into it, we put data in and a key. And it's used to authenticate messages because only the person that has the key can um, create uh, the, the MAC code. <coughs> The most common of these is really the HMAC algorithm, which simply wraps a hash function um, in a... I think there's something trying to get in. Um, uh, wraps a hash function um, in something that enables it to add a key. And we'll find there's a whole family of these that are just built on top of the hash functions that we've already seen. So you, there's HMAC MD5, HMAC uh, SHA256, and so on, including the truncated hashes that I mentioned before. There's another one which we'll see occasionally, this Poly1305. That's a pure, ha a pure MAC code that's not intended to be a hash at all. It's only implemented as a MAC. And the, uh, that's generally not used by itself. It's only really used in integration with other things, as we'll see in a bit. So how do you use the MAC functions in Sodium? Well, the hash HMAC function is much like the hash function in PHP. It allows you to choose algorithms, and there are plenty of choices in there that are weak and should not be used. But again, Sodium takes that away from you uh, and doesn't give you a choice of algorithm. So here I've implemented um, uh, this exactly the same. You'll get exactly the same result out of these two functions. The first one is using PHP's built-in hash HMAC. We said that we're going to use SHA512, and then you can see that we're truncating it to 64 characters, which will give us our 256-bit um, hex-encoded result. Now, you can see that in the sodium one, I'm applying bin to hex to the output. And the, uh, the reason for that is that quite a lot of the sodium functions that will actually return you binary values of these keys and um, whatever else it is that we're dealing with. It returns them as pure binary things. Um, people tend to get a little wary of binary things, and I'm a big fan of just storing raw binary stuff like this into databases because it takes half the space. Um, and it means your indexes take half the space, which means you can fit nearly like twice as much in memory and everything goes faster. Um, so <coughs> storing binary values is fine. But here I've used bin to hex because you can see that it actually produces the identical result that PHP built in. Going the other way, uh, we want to be able to verify a hash, and we do that with the hash equals function, um, which is auth verify in Sodium. And again, this is much the same way. Uh, we're, we're truncating it to 64 characters, and again, we're providing the, the, the actual the MAC code, the message, and the key that we use to, to uh, sign it with. <coughs> Right, this is a slightly odd question. Um, this is something that we see in, in quite a lot of uh, secret key and public key encryptions, which we'll get to. And it's, uh, aside from the unfortunate British slang meaning, these are actually extremely simple things. All a nonce is, is a number that's used once. <clears throat> and when we say once, we mean once in any single context and for the foreseeable future. Um, so typically this involves um, a random or pseudo-random number often containing a timestamp. And we want there to be enough, enough bits in there to, uh, to either be sufficiently random altogether by just using a very large number <coughs> or to contain a fine enough timestamp to prevent accidental reuse. 
And nonces are used all over the place in cryptography. Um, if you've ever used HTTP digest authentication and get a, a 401 response from a server, the, the 401 response will actually include a nonce, which you then use to encrypt your, your response to that um, request. And that enables the request to be resistant to replay attacks because the nonce is only ever used once. It means that, that for that single round trip, uh, it, it's only valid for that single round trip, which prevents somebody who's managed to intercept all the traffic in between these two um, ends of the, the conversation um, isn't able to then replay that against the, the, the target server to try and um, authenticate uh, because they don't have the nonce, uh, well, more to the point, the nonce they're trying to use is the wrong one. It's an old one. It won't work anymore. It's also what Bitcoin miners are looking for. Um, when they're mining these things, they're looking for the nonce which is going to produce a hash that's going to match the precise thing that's going uh, to, uh, to enable them to unlock this block in the, in the chain. Um, they're also used as initialization vectors. And you might think of these as much like using salts in password hashing. Um, it's like or a, a seed in a random number generator. It just gives you a starting point for the encryption to, to get going on something. Um, and because of that, you'll find that they're used all over the place in both secret and public key encryption. But the golden rule is that you, no, that you never reuse the nonce with the same key. Now, one of the things here is, well, what size random number should we be using for this? And again, this is somewhere where you could make the wrong decision. And sodium does let you vary it, and you can put wrong values into it. However, sodium does provide size constants, which you should use in place of your own um, numbers. And the idea there is that as PHP versions go on, those, those numbers might be increased. Um, by PHP itself. And so that, again, that problem is effectively taken away from you. Now, to actually generate one of these, all you actually need is the PHP random bytes function. Um, so that's very straightforward. You just say, give me this many random bytes. And the random bytes function is a good uh, cryptographically secure source of random data. So we get on to secret key encryption. And this is very straightforward. It's encryption and decryption using the same key. And for the several thousand years prior to the 1970s, this was basically the only kind of encryption that was actually available, um, it, aside from simple substitution ciphers and things. Um, if you want to encrypt something, you had to have both the person sending the message and the person receiving the message had to have the same key. And that's a really big problem, because how do you send the key between them secretly? Um, that has quite a few issues. So because of this symmetry of having the, the, the uh, encrypt and decrypt with the same key, these are referred to as symmetric ciphers, um, as opposed to asymmetric ciphers, which are used in, in public key encryption. One of the things that's just curious about this is that just because you've done this encryption with, with secret key encryption, it doesn't actually guarantee integrity or authenticity. It's entirely possible that you could encrypt something and then somebody in between that sees the message could add something onto it. While they couldn't necessarily read the message, they can effectively corrupt it in some way by adding additional data to it that you don't know about. Um, and the encryption algorithm wouldn't be any the wiser. It would simply decrypt the data that it had been given, and it wouldn't know that it was wrong in any way. And the way that you solve that is by sticking a Mac on top of it because that applies a, a signature to the whole message, and that way any tampering with it, um, you're, you're guaranteed that it will be visible, so you're guaranteeing the integrity, and by the key that's, that's um, used on the Mac, you're also guaranteeing that it's done, that it was signed by the person who said that, it, that they'd signed it. So in Sodium, we've got these secret box functions, and these provide a combined encrypt then Mac operation. And it's important that this op these things happen in that order, because if you did it the other way around and you're on the receiving end, you'd have to decrypt the message before you could establish its authenticity or integrity, whereas really you want to be able to do it the other way around. There's no point in decrypting the thing um, if you already know that it's corrupt in some way. There's another set of um, ways that you can use 
secret key encryption in Libsodium using something called AEAD ciphers. And the AEAD stands for Authenticated Encryption with Additional Data. So this is just like the Encrypt Then Mac um, process, but it's actually combined, and the cipher actually provides the guarantee of integrity and authenticity itself. The, the, whole, the cipher suite is just tuned to do the whole thing in one go. <clears throat> so it achieves the same thing as the Encrypt Then Mac, but it's just more efficient. Now, in Libsodium, it provides two implementations. Now, these are effectively of equal strength, which is why it, it gives you the choice. Um, however, they have other characteristics that are of interest. Now, typically, ChaCha20 is an extremely efficient cipher. It, uses, uh, it, it runs really fast on even really quite low-powered hardware, so it's really good on things like phone CPUs. Um, AES encryption, on the other hand, is really quite heavy duty. But what's happened is that because it's very heavy and but is used so frequently, Intel added a whole load of hardware acceleration instructions to make AES go a lot faster. And that means that if you're on a laptop or desktop machine um, with a recent Intel CPU, it's going to have AES acceleration. So you'll find that it will actually be faster than ChaCha20. So it really depends on your audience. Mobile, or, mobile users will probably be better off with ChaCha20, and mainly desktop or mo, um, laptop users will be better off with AES. But what's happening is that some mobile CPUs are gaining their own hardware acceleration. So AES is actually becoming more viable on uh, mobiles. So how do we actually do all this? Well. Here's a little code example. Again, you can see we're using the constants out of um, sodium. They, they all have these really long names. I don't know why they did that, but whatever. Um, so you can see that it, the secret box functions has the secret box key bytes, and we're just getting some random bytes, and that's the value we're going to use as our key. Um, then we're asking it to get some random data for a nonce. Now, just for your reference, currently those values, the key bytes value is currently 32 and the nonce bytes value is 24. So that's, those are bytes, not bits. So that's actually quite a lot of bits. Um, so then we, we, we encrypt our content. We've given it the content, the nonce, and the key. And there's an alternative implementation here, which is using one of these AEAD ciphers. And we've chosen to use the char 20 poly 1305 one here. And that effectively does the same thing with the same parameters. Though you notice, though, that we provide the nonce value twice. And the reason for this is that it's just a, a convenient thing that the AEAD ciphers allow you to have some encrypted data and some unencrypted data, but the MAC is actually applied to the whole thing, to both the encrypted and unencrypted data, and you send them both together. So there's a little piece of the message which is actually public and visible, but that can be a useful thing to do, for example, to put the nonce in to enable you to transmit it. The nonce itself doesn't have any cryptographic value other than the fact that, you sh that it's only ever going to be used once. So having that fact revealed isn't actually anything that, um, that threatens the security of the, uh, of the process that we're going through. So to decrypt it, we just do the reverse. We give it the, cipher, the encrypted text, the nonce, and the key, and it decrypts it. And the same goes for the, um, for the, uh, the AEAD version. There are some small variants on that also in Libsodium uh, that have specific compatibility with other implementations of the same encryption algorithms, which are from the IETF. And the X version is a version which just allows you to use larger values for the nonce, which uh, is for especially um, sensitive data. Now, in future, there will actually be a simpler function named just AEAD encrypt. And the reason that that's not there yet, is that it's relying on, on awaiting the results of a, a competition um, called CESAR. And there, these things happen quite often. They've, they've been used for ciphers and hash functions and so on. Um, and in this case, there are, there's a competition going on between numerous academics and, uh, and governments to come up with what's going to be the AEAD cipher of choice for, um, for governments and so on, for, for people that want to have uh, a solid, reliable choice uh, for these things. And it's pretty likely, probably, to be um, something like char 20 or AES-256. But that hasn't been decided as yet, so we're just awaiting the value of that. And once it's been won, that function will spring into life, um, and that's where it's going to be. So it's a, just a placeholder for now. So finally, we get on to the things with two keys. And this brings us to uh, the private and public key encryption. So each end has a pair of keys, not just one. 
uh, one of which can be made public. Literally, you can post it on a website. For example, this is what's used in TLS when you, when you connect to an HTTPS server. When you connect to it, it just simply provides you with its public key. And if you have an OpenSSL command line client, it's really easy to just go and say, get me the, the public key from that server. And it will just give you a dump of the public key. The trick is really is that messages encrypted with a public key can be decrypted with a private key, and actually kind of vice versa. Um, this is a critical component of key exchange. So the, this, the problem here is that public key encryption algorithms are extremely slow, often factors of thousands of times slower than secret key encryption. And so the problem here is that, well, it's all very well not having to have a, a key that's shared in advance, so we don't have to worry about that whole business of how do we make sure the other end has a key. Um, but what we can do is switch once we've um, made the initial connection and managed to pass a key from one side to the other, we can then switch to using a much faster symmetric encryption system. And that's exactly how TLS works. It makes, it, makes, um, uh, it makes a connection and then does a key exchange using something like Diffie-Hellman or X24519 and um, passes the key across and then it switches to a symmetric cipher like AES. Now, um, within Libsodium, there's this crypto box function. Um, the, the box function, you notice, it's just called box and not crypto, bo uh, not uh, secret box. And again, there's a whole family of these. And internally, it uses X25519 key exchange with the XSalsa20 stream cipher, which is uh, effectively a predecessor of uh, ChaCha20, but is still a good, strong, fast cipher, and the Poly1305 MAC code. So this is how you actually implement it. Now this is actually a complete, more or less, uh, example of, of being able to use um, key exchange and um, public key encryption between two nodes. So the, this is split across two different nodes. So first of all, on, on each node, we create a key pair and then extract the secret and the public keys from those pairs. And then we want to encrypt a message on node A that we're going to send to node B. Now the first thing we do is this thing, and the first time I saw this, I was going like, is that really how it works? I was quite amazed. Um, but you literally take your secret key and the other end's public key, and you just concat them together. And that's it. That's your key. Um, then we need a nonce, so we just generate uh, a bunch of random bytes using a constant. Um, I've used the secret box constant there. They, it, there's probably a different one for the uh, public key thing, but that one will do. Um, and uh, we then create the, um, the encrypted message. And notice that we're just sticking the nonce on the front of it. That doesn't get encrypted, but it doesn't need to be. But we need to be able to convey it to the other end so that they can use it at the other end to initialize their, their um, uh, ciphers. And then at the other end, we do the reverse. We take our own secret key and the other end's public key. And again, we just concat the two, and that becomes our decryption key for the same message. The thing which is freaky here is you can see the, that it actually has a different key at either end. They're the, they're the public and private keys, but just swapped over um, for the receiver and sender. That's, uh, I don't know, when I first saw that, I, I was kind of amazed that it's sort of elegance. It's, it's really quite a nice thing to see. Um, but underneath, there's all this mathematics going on, but the actual way you do it is, is really quite straightforward. So then we extract the nonce and the encrypted text from the ciphertext itself, because you see we tacked it on when we sent it, and now we're just stripping it off when we receive it. And then we pass in all that information into the box open function, and voila, we have our decrypted data. So that's public key encryption done. So just covering some of the other smaller things that are in Libsodium. Key derivation, the PW hash function actually has a little bit more flexibility than the, the standard PW hash string variant of it. Um, and it gives you a little bit more control if you want it. But again, it omits the uh, bad crypto. There are, no, there are no bad options inside there. Um, you can actually just do key exchange all by itself without progressing to actually transferring a message. So this, this might be used, for example, um, I don't know if anybody of you, anybody, any of you use MOSH on a, in terminal sessions. Um, MOSH stands for the mobile shell. And the way that that works is it connects via SSH and transfers a key 
and it also authenticates you at that point. But then it just drops the SSH connection and connects via UDP, but using the key that it exchanged via SSH. It's very much the same kind of thing. So you might get a key to use somewhere else, and you just want to have the, the ability to exchange these keys without actually integrating that key exchange with a follow-on to an encrypted session uh, in the same context. Um, there's a great explanation on Wikipedia of how key exchange actually works. They have this wonderful analogy using um, color mixing, uh, which is it, it's a very elegant explanation of it. I'm not going to try and do it here because it can be quite confusing. You need to pay attention. <laughs> um, and then finally, digital signatures. Digital signatures are kind of like using public key encryption backwards. Um, that rather than uh, hiding the content, we're effectively dropping the confidentiality aspect of it, but while retaining the integrity and um, authenticity parts. So we get, we've got, a, play, I've got a, a publicly viewable message, but we can prove who it came from um, and prove that it hasn't been tampered with, and that's a digital signature. Now, they're effectively like a stronger form of a Mac code, because one of the weaknesses of a Mac is, again, we've got this shared key problem that anybody who can verify a key can also generate a new Mac because the, the, the key is the same in both contexts. But with digital signatures, it's not. We can sign something and nobody else can produce that signature because they don't have the private key that we use to create that signature. Um, so this is why sometimes, sometimes um, you get things like image file downloads um, where they provide either a hash or a MAC code, and they provide a key. Um, now, the problem is, is that anybody who, and this has happened in some repositories and things, where some malicious actor has got in and managed to replace um, uh, images of, sort of Linux boot, boot volumes, for example, and, so, and tweaked something and also substituted the, the hash for the image that people have downloaded. And so it's gone undetected for that reason. They wouldn't be able to do that if they're using digital signatures instead. But the thing is that people tend not to actually go about and, and verify these things, so they often get away with it. Um, but there we go. Now, not everything's entirely roses. There's this thing that I found just really irritating in the way that something had been um, implemented in PHP 7.2. So PHP 7.2 added the password um, argon2i. Uh, the, so it's the argon2i algorithm, which is the side channel resistant one, but not the better ID version. Um, but the implementation inside PHP is actually provided by libargon2 and not by uh, libsodium. And libargon2 isn't included in the base installation, so you can't actually rely on it being there. Now, sodium itself provides the better argon2 ID um, uh, algorithm that we've seen, um, but that's not used by password hash. Now, the argon2 ID algorithm is being added in PHP 7.3, but they've done exactly the same thing. Um, that if you don't have libargon2, even though there's a perfectly good argon2 ID implementation sitting there in libsodium, right there in the same binary, um, it doesn't use it. So that's a, a really annoying omission from, from the PHP build. And uh, I saw actually that um, Laravel actually added support for argon2 password hashing quite recently, but unfortunately they missed the opportunity to bridge that problem, uh, to be able to abstract it, to say that if you didn't have um, uh, lib argon2 installed, then you could use argon, um, argon2 ID from libsodium instead. Though, to be fair, that's only really going to be um, workable if you have uh, PHP 7.3, which isn't actually out yet, of course. The alternative, of course, is that you can simply use sodium's own password hash functions instead, and that avoids that problem. So, getting back on track to how this might work in Laravel, this is something that I've done. Um, I've only actually ever built one Laravel project. <laughs> uh, I, I tend not to do much in the way of um, sort of large-scale programming. I'm doing more low-level stuff. And, but this is something that I needed to do. Um, and this was just a pure API. And people could authenticate against it, and they'd be given an API token in return. Now, typically, this kind of uh, this API token would be stored in, um, would be a reference to a session uh, stored on the server side. But if you want to be stateless and um, make your server side life a little easier, um, in common with 
almost all truly scalable solutions, you want to try and transfer that responsibility to the client end. Because as the number of clients increases, the number of clients increases. And so you can just get the clients to do the work, and they do effectively do the scaling of that aspect of it for you. So here, somebody logs in. Um, we've, we've picked the, uh, the application key out of our environment. We, uh, we calculate an expiry time for their session. Uh, we generate a nonce that we're going to use for this. We encrypt the whole thing. So we've got the user ID that's, that's logged in, uh, the expiry time of their thing. And we, because we're using the secret box function, or the AEAD cipher version of it, we provide the nonce uh, as both the nonce and the um, additional data and our key and encrypt the whole thing. Um, and this is all happening on the server side. And then we embed that into a JSON response and send that back to our client. And you can see that the actual API token is actually the nonce with the encrypted data tacked onto the end. And that means that we can extract the nonce from it and use it to, to uh, to reinitialize the, the ciphers to the same thing. Now, one of the things about this is that this is a, a symmetric situation because our encrypt and decrypt are actually happening in the same place. They both occur on the server. Um, um, so when it comes to the other end of it, which is where we then later on receive another request from the same client, and they've passed in the API token in a header, we then extract that header and decode it and decrypt it. So we strip out the nonce and the ciphertext because we just concatenated them. We know how big it was, so we can just take them apart again. We get the key again, and we pass them into the uh, decrypt version of the, um, of the secret key in encryption function, and we get the, the decrypted data back out. Then we actually validate what we got out just to make sure that it's actually still valid. So for example, we check that it uh, hasn't expired. Um, we check that um, we can actually get uh, the user that we're looking for. And we then go, yep, that's fine. And the thing is here, we don't really have to worry about the security of this because we're never referring to any information that's actually ever visible to the client. And the client can't tamper with that data without us knowing about it. The, the, uh, the API token that they give back to us, if they've tampered with it in any way, even adjusted a single bit of it, then the MAC code will fail and we all know that it's not a legitimate API token. And that means then we don't have to store anything on the server side. We can just put everything into this little token, and that gives us enough information to maintain a, um, a session on the server without actually having any state stored on the server at all. So that's kind of handy. Um, as, as far as performance goes, Symmetric ciphers are extremely fast, so we really don't need to worry about performance on that. And the other thing is, we're only encrypting a very small item anyway, um, so that's not really going to be uh, much of a problem. The only time when you might have a problem with this kind of approach is a, is a different kind of problem. You need to distribute your key across, if, if you have a, a load balance cluster doing this, you need to have the same key across them because you don't know which one's going to receive any subsequent requests, so they need to be using that same key. So that in itself could be a different problem, but that's not something we're dealing with here. So documentation. Now, this is a little unfortunate. You're going to see this quite a bit in the PHP docs. Um, but if you're looking for a way of contributing to PHP, you can add to it yourself. Uh, but fortunately, there's also a whole bunch of other documentation. Because Libsodium is available for other languages, uh, plus it has its own documentation just as a pure C library, you'll find that the vast majority of functions um, within Libsodium itself are um, exactly the same as they've appeared in PHP. There are only some sort of small uh, differences to uh, to, to get between the two. And in particular, the Paragon Initiative's website has got a, a whole load of stuff that's related to the PECL version of the extension, um, which is not docu documented in uh, the standard PHP doc site, but is pretty much the information that you need to know um, and is largely the same. Um, but as it stands, I, I've been working on the documentation myself, and there's a whole load of stuff sitting in the queue waiting for somebody to review it. Um, I'm not sure who that might be, but uh, hopefully that'll get done at some point. So if you feel like contributing to PHP docs, that will be a really good place to do it. So just to summarize, never roll your own crypto. Avoid using anything with uh, legacy cryptography functions in new applications, and upgrade stuff when you can. But generally speaking, Sodium in PHP 
removes ambiguity and doubt. It takes away a lot of decisions which might be confusing or difficult um, and just gives you stuff that's going to work and be strong and not uh, fail when you need it to. So overall, it really raises the security bar for what security features are available in PHP. But we do need your help for the documentation. Um, so that's pretty much it. Do we have any questions? One here. Um, SS, what, say SSL pinning. When you can actually check if that website is truly in the line with the address. PHP in general. But for the most part, that would be taken care of at, your, uh, at the SSL level, um, that handshakes and things would fail if, if signatures don't match as expected. Um, and you, you verify uh, any connection that comes from, um, from outside. You would verify that using your own collection of, of CA certificates. Um, so that's not something that you're relying on any outside data for. So that's, that's just the way that TLS works anyway. But um, the pinning part of it th is typically done with HPKP headers, though that's really kind of falling away now. Um, that all happens within, within the browser. It's the browser that checks pinning, so it's not really something that happens on the PHP side. Okay. Anyone else? So I can't see you there. Okay. All right. Well, I've put the slides up there. Though for some reason it put dot one on the end, even though it's dot two. I don't know why. Anyway, there you go. Thank you.